some wonderful presenters. And this being the time of year when people think of holidays and festivities and parties, uh, it's also a wonderful time to plan. Plan for next year, plan for yet this year, because there's a lot of business that can be done between now and the end of the year. Uh, people tend to slow down a little bit, and this is a wonderful time for networking. I know Keith and I were at a networking function last night, and, and that was very, very, very productive. And this is a good time to be going. If you're invited to a holiday party, and if you hate them as much as I do, go to them, because the networking possibilities and potentials are enormous. This is the time to get to know people, not just to find out who they are, but get to know people and see how you can collaborate, see how you can work together, see what interests you share. And I think this is a good time for that. It's also a good time to plan for next year. Um, I personally like to set goals, and I set fairly lofty goals. So that way, I'm always striving to reach those goals. And for next year, we have some very exciting things coming up, S things that uh, will be brought to the surface probably starting in January, which I hope you'll find really interesting from a business perspective, very innovative, very aggressive, and we're, we're anxious to start bringing some of those things to HBCFI and, and to you and to those watching worldwide. Most of them, if not all of them, have global implications, so we're very excited about that. So this morning, we, we, we had a program designed, and as things happen, things happen. Uh, things change. Uh, one of our presenters, uh, Artemis Automation, will not be joining us this morning for whatever reason, and we'll work around that. We're also having some difficulties getting through to our, our contacts in Greece, and as soon as they're online, we'll bring them up as well. But we have two presenters that are here that we're not letting es uh, escape until their presentations are completed. And I know that people this morning have come from great distances. Chip, come all the way from Princeton this morning. Thank you very much for coming. We appreciate it. And uh, what we'd like to do is get started. I I'd also like to, to make one, one quick introduction. Martin, where are you? Oh, there you are. Martin, tell us everybody who you are a little bit. Martin, thank you very much for being here this morning. Uh, Microloans are playing an ever-increasing role in getting early-stage businesses fun funded up and running so they can become sustainable. And uh, we're very happy to have you this morning, and thanks to Tamara as well. Uh, right now, I would like to introduce one of our featured speakers, Beth Bornick. Beth is representing a group called SATOP. And she's going to come up here and sing and dance for you while I cue up her presentation in the back. Beth, come on up. I was really impressed with the uh, rolling ladder. I thought I could do a big Broadway entrance down the staircase. Uh, can everyone hear me all right? Yeah. I'm a little short in the microphone. So I came down from Albany today. Uh, I work for the Syracuse Technology Garden. Uh, 
uh, which is an incubator in Syracuse, New York. Um, as an umbrella organization, we're called the Tech Garden, and we have people in Long Island, Albany, and Syracuse. And we run a number of economic development programs, including this one, which is SATOP, the Space Alliance Technology Outreach Program. And this is um, a NASA grant-funded program. And I'll tell you all about it. Um, the clicker works. I'm not sure where I should be pointing it. Ah, there we go. The Space Alliance Technology Outreach Program, it's been around since uh, at least 2001. It actually began earlier than that as an outreach program from Kennedy Space Center and Johnson Space Center um, in uh, Cape Canaveral and in Houston for their engineers to reach out to the small business community and uh, use their expertise to help small businesses succeed in their own uh, endeavors. So this program provides 40 hours, or up to 40 hours, of free engineering assistance to small businesses. Uh, it's a partnership of not only the NASA centers, but more importantly, a group of alliance partners who are uh, aerospace contractors and universities, um, as well as economic development organizations and chambers of commerce who get the word out to small business. And the goal of SATOP is a means of doing a technology transfer. It's really more transferring the knowledge that's been built up in the U.S. space industry out to small <coughs> businesses. <coughs> SATOP has four uh, centers across the U.S. This year, the Tech Garden is actually managing the four-state program. Uh, in prior years, the TRDA in Florida has managed it, but this year we happened to get the big grant, so we lead. Uh, next year, Bay Area Houston in Texas got the big grant, so they're going to lead. We all pool our resources together and have one central management. We also work with Regional Development Corporation in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And so between these four centers, we take requests from all across the U.S. Our expertise is on the side here. We work with almost all sorts of engineering challenges. The only thing we don't get involved in is software and IT type of solutions. We really want something that we can come in, provide some expertise, and not have to deal with, you know, bug fixes, updates, integration problems of that nature. We just stay out of the software realm. But we uh, frequently uh, work with materials questions, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, um, and a whole variety of different technology areas. The uh, um, 40 hours of free assistance is an upper limit. Some of the requests are as few as a couple of hours. Uh, it really just depends on how much information uh, the alliance partner already has in their, in their um, expertise to provide and the nature of the problem. Uh, the NASA-funded program we are a grant-funded organization. Uh, it is actually an appropriation, so if you think about um, the whole federal budget process, you can imagine that we're on pins and needles right now waiting for um, the federal omnibus bill to be passed or not passed to determine whether we're funded for 2012. But um, next year's funding is, uh, is already committed. This is a really cool slide because this is our whole group of alliance partners, and these are the engineering resources that we draw upon to provide a solution. Um, the partners are uh, designated by the amount of time that they pledge to the program. So a platinum partner like Lockheed Martin, um, New Mexico State University, United Space Alliance, these are partners that have pledged uh, a significant commitment to the program. But really, even the bronze partners provide a lot of solutions for us and really help us diversify our expertise. And if you look at Clarkson University, um, uh, SUNY Binghamton, these are our uh, local partners. Uh, Silver, Syracuse University, OSHIC's Environmental Safety is New York, uh, CUNY. Uh, we have some very cool uh, New York partners, Rensselaer and the Gold. So uh, any company that is an aerospace contractor or university that receives NASA research funding 
can participate as an alliance partner. And it gives their engineers a cool way to sort of flex their technical muscles and try new, uh, try new things and um, do, uh, in, in a way, uh, short-term projects like, like a, um, with an immediate impact for small businesses. Um, I do need to update this. I've been using this slide all year, but we haven't run a new economic impact survey yet. That's one of my tasks for the first quarter of next year. Um, 2,100 positive solutions since 2001, which means that the small business submitted a request, we matched them with an alliance partner, and they got a, a positive solution. Uh, the economic cumulative economic impact, uh, 571 million and uh, over 1,300 jobs. And again, we went, this program did have a gap in funding uh, about 2007 to 2009. So there were a couple years there we weren't operational. And there's also about a year and a half that we didn't do the economic survey. So there's about two years of economic impact and not in this number. So I want to talk about the success stories because this is what really helps understand what the program does. There's just a huge variety of these, and we have them on our website, which is spacetechsolutions.com. There's a flyer at the entrance table uh, that has that link on it, but um, I'll talk about a few stories today. This is CPAC Inc. They're in Elmira, and they manufacture electromagnetic clutches and brakes for aerospace, uh, military use primarily. And they had a component that they wanted to reduce the weight of it, but still maintain the strength and reliability of the product. So this is a mechanical design uh, a modification. You know, when you come to SATOP, you really have to have your design. We couldn't design this part for you, but we can help you improve. So uh, we matched them with our partner in Connecticut, Design by Analysis, and they actually came up with uh, recommendations for how to make that part uh, lighter, and they also developed a little general analysis tool for these guys that they could use for other such parts and, and do their own calculations in, in other situations. Okay. August 9th analysis is in Scarsdale, New York, and they develop process automation technology for small-scale chemical manufacturing and industri industry. Um, and what they wanted was uh, they were creating a single unit that would be really an uh, analytical lab and process control all in one for chemical manufacturing. But they needed help in the actual integration of the optical and the uh, controller technologies into one. They worked with Census Corporation in Syracuse. Uh, Census isn't a partner this year, but uh, we hope to get them back next year. Uh, they were able to, to uh, work with someone who, who knew how to integrate these components into a single control box and also made some recommendations about having uh, a main control box and separate remote boxes apart from the host computer. This is a story from Texas and I thought I'd put this in here because I, I think it's a really cool um, social entrepreneurship project that this company is doing. And it's also kind of a cool Christmas gift, so if you were thinking about something like that. Um, this is the BOGO light, and it is a solar-powered flashlight that's intended to be used as primary lighting in developing countries, cases where they might be burning kerosene inside a house, um, really um, a, a bad situation. And this is a, a much safer light source. And um, so they developed this solar power light but the LEDs in the flashlight kept breaking and they were not able to figure out what the problem was. And we matched them up with uh, another Texas company, MEI Technologies, and they were able to determine that the supplier was not using the proper amount of metal. It was a quality problem with the, um, with the supply. And so they were able to go and find a new supplier in order to uh, get around that problem. Um, the cool thing about this light, they call it BOGO, which is buy one, get one. If you want to do uh, a gift as a charitable um, effort, you can buy a light and they will donate a matching light to uh, any one of a number of uh, charitable organizations in developing countries. The Sigma Equipment Corporation, this is a White Plains company. 
and they make ma machinery for chemical, uh, cosmetics, pharmaceutical industries, and they were having problems in the production of a roller part. And so on somewhere throughout this production line, these rollers were cracking and the parts had to be scrapped. And we have a great partner in New Mexico State University in their manufacturing well, and NMSU had equipment and um, a, a variety of different ways that they could observe both the parts and the manufacturing process, and they were able to come up with the um, solution for that challenge. Uh, unfortunately, I don't remember what the solution was. Uh, I couldn't find it in the story, but this was something that they, the small business was not able to come up with in-house. They just did not have the resources, and they were not able to find that solution for themselves. This is a clean tech story from Syracuse, New York, Fitzsimmons Systems, developing a patent pending process for biodiesel production. And they wanted to recycle the methanol back out at the end of the process, and they needed a, a way, the best way, a recommendation for the best way to separate that methanol from the water. Again, New Mexico State University, and they uh, recommended two different processes depending on the purity that they might need the methanol to be at the end. If you're getting the feeling that we do a lot of recommendations for something that's already working, a process that's already in place, a, a product that already exists, you know, what's the best material, maybe a better adhesive, uh, how to better uh, choose a component, usually we're looking for uh, ways to apply know-how that's already out there. We're not researching and developing anything new. Here's a company up in the Albany area, Comfortex, and they make honeycomb blinds, they make uh, window shades. Uh, these are their wood alloy shutters, and they were having a lot of shutters return due to damage during shipping, and they just were not able to make the packaging strong enough to prevent it. Um, we matched them up with MRI Technologies in Texas. And we, we generally say that we're not able to do testing. You know, we're not a test lab. We don't have test facilities. Some of the universities do. Um, in this case, MRI did have a way to actually do stress tests on a set of packaged shutters and determine where and how to best reinforce that packaging. Um, often what happens is that if, if we are able to do testing, it's usually an adjunct to the real question. So they, they may have you know, been able to recommend how to reinforce the packaging anyway, but the, the uh, stress test just re confirmed it. Uh, just to show that we're not all high-tech products, uh, Satop does work with really any kind of business. We have a lot of success stories in uh, the food industry, agriculture, uh, does not have to be developing a high-tech product in order to work with us. This is a company in Syracuse, Mark Anthony Foods, and they do uh, high quality Italian style salami and products like that. And they were needing a way to help make the curing process of the salami more consistent from batch to batch. And they worked with United Space Alliance, and they were able to recommend a humidity control system for them to monitor the drying room and uh, technology to actually monitor the drying process. Again, probably technology they used in some way themselves that was applicable to another industry. And this one's a lot of fun too, Pro Aquatics in Florida. This is really a good example of how just having another pair of eyes looking at something from an entirely different industry can help you get a solution. In this case, really quickly, um, this is uh, a supplier of saltwater fish for aquariums and pet stores, and they ship the fish in plastic bags with half water and half uh, air or uh, oxygen. And during shipment, the oxygen was leaking out the seal at the top of the bag, which uh, harmed the fish. And United Space Alliance looked at the problem and the company was afraid that they would recommend you know, some expensive new high-tech way to seal the bags. But what they really said was, well, if you take that bag and you flip it over so that the water is resting on the seal when you ship it, the water's not gonna leak out, or the air's, the oxygen's not gonna leak out. So that was really all it, all it took. And uh, just, just kind of a, a, a cool little 
solution. And a cute picture. So the specifics of how this works. Requests for technical assistance, we call them RTAs. You have to be a US-based business. You have to be 500 or fewer employees. Um, you have to have a very distinct and identifiable technical challenge. You, know, you really have to, to, to be able to define it and explain it really well to an alliance partner for a couple of reasons. If we have a database where all these requests are stored. Uh, it talks about what the problem is. It doesn't mention the name of the company, but it gives the information that an alliance partner would need to determine if they have the expertise to volunteer for this. So if it's a very vague challenge, people don't volunteer for it and it's never going to get solved. Also, if it's a sort of a, a vague and open-ended problem, then it's not something we know for sure we can wrap up in 40 hours. Now, we don't do anything larger than 40 hours, so it's not going to be the kind of situation where you, the first 40 hours are free and then we charge you. We want to be able to wrap it up in 40 hours. You know, if it's 41 or 42, it's not an issue. Um, and if you do make a relationship with a, an alliance partner and you guys want to work together after the SATOP project, that's fine too. But as a rule, most of the alliance partners aren't available for that. Um, oops, I think I hit my button. There we go. Um, so it's got to be a very distinct problem. Um, you have to have your design. If you're um, developing a new product, you have to have you know, maybe the design or a prototype and drawings, it can't be just an idea. Uh, we do get uh, requests from people who have an idea for a product and they want us to design the whole thing. Um, we don't want to do that for a number of reasons and that's not what we're, not what our mission is. We're here to solve problems with, with your ideas, with your projects. Um, we also don't want to be developing any new intellectual property. So we don't want a SATOC request to result in you know, inventorship of a new patented, patentable idea, um, because then, you know, our our uh, project engine or our engineers are going to actually be really co-inventors on your patent, and that's not something you want to get involved in either. So we stay out of anything where we're developing a whole new design. Uh, and if it's something that you can easily find, a, a, you know a solution in, in your community, um, working with another service provider and consulting and so forth, uh, we really try and stay out of those as well. It's another reason for staying out of IT. Now you could argue that really any challenge you could go out and hire someone to solve, but in a lot of cases it's cost prohibitive or you don't know how to find the right person or you've tried and failed. So it's, it's really, it's a bit of a judgment call, but it's, we're not here to just be, um, you know, to replace 40 hours of time for somebody that you have in-house that can already solve the problem or someone that you could easily access that could solve the problem. The idea is you can't solve it with your own resources, either internal or um, uh, external. Okay. So you have this challenge, you know, help me find a better adhesive to hold these two strange pieces of material together. Um, what you do is go to spacetechsolutions.com and we have uh, an online form that you go through and fill out. One of the handouts that I have on the table back there is actually a worksheet that shows you what all the questions are in that form and it fits on the front and back of a piece of paper. So it's not like we want you to write a grant application or anything like that. It's pretty straightforward. Um, we want to know, you know about the company, what you think the economic impact is, um, you know, what the, the project is, what the nature of the technical challenge is, and so forth. And that will come in, once it's entered into the database, it'll go to our SATOP project engineer in the local area. And for us, that's Medi Calabala in my office. And he will review the request and give you a call to ask, you know, answer any, ask for any um, additional material he might need or ask you questions about the project. Um, your written request does not have to be 100% of all the details you could tell us about the project. Uh, if there's things that are, are uncertain or sketchy, you guys can fill that in when you're working with many. Uh, we really just want to get the, the gist of the idea in there to get us started. Okay. 
once he's gone through with you and made sure he understands clearly what kind of expertise is needed and what the limits of the project are, that request will be opened up to the alliance partners. They can go into the same database. Again, they can't see who the company is, but they can see the right, the um, summary, the description summary of the request. And they also weekly, the project engineers from the four states will get to, will, will collaborate online and, and they'll email out the requests to all the alliance partners and they'll talk about who they think might be a good match for what. Now, this is, this is um, always the uncertainty, is how long will it take to find a partner and will we find a partner who has the expertise? Um, if a match is found, uh, the alliance partner is going to be um, working with the project engineer to get whatever information they might need. They will then set up a conference call. So it'll be launched with a conference call with you, the alliance partner, and the SATOP engineer in order to get things rolling. So there may be also throughout the, pro the uh, project additional conference calls or more information that the alliance partner needs from you. So we ask that you really plan to, to set aside some time for this process. Um, one of the most frequent reasons we have to close a request without a solution is because the requester just doesn't ever get back to the alliance partner with whatever they might need. You know, they might ask for dimensions of something or, you know, pictures of something or, you know, can you try this and get back to me and tell me how it worked? And the requester just never responds. So that's really, it's disappointing for the partners uh, who were really invested in getting you a solution and, um, you know, it's, it's resources we could have spent helping someone else. So really just plan to commit a little bit of time to work with this partner to get a solution. Okay. Um, the partner is going to work over the course of a 90-day period, so it's not a 40-hour solid week. Uh, the partners are really fitting this in amongst their regular day-to-day -day work, and um, in some cases they might have the time to put in a, a, a focused effort, in some cases it's a little bit here and there. But we try to wrap everything up within 90 days. I have to say we're not doing that well in that this, this uh, summer, but um, so the, if, if you do need something with a quick turnaround, a couple of weeks, um, it's not really the program, the right program, but um, that's, that's my presentation. Here's our, our contact information. Uh, it's all on the handouts as well. This is my New York team, Mehdi Kalabala on the left, uh, Kathy Nidzwicki in Syracuse. And uh, on the right, Larry Kalish down in Long Island. So um, we uh, really are pretty well distributed, kind of a virtual, virtual group. Um, and uh, Les, do we have time for some questions, do you think? Certainly. Anybody have any questions? Yeah. And make them up. <laughs> solutions that may be overseas? Well, because this is federally funded, uh, grant funded program, it has to be a U.S. based business. Um, we've had, uh, you know, being so close to Canada, that's usually the first question as well, is can someone in Canada participate? Um, really, you've got to have a, a U.S. office and, it, and it's, it's uh, you know, or um, U.S. operations. So it's kind of a trade-off. When you're seeking a solution, would mm -hmm. you look for companies that may have that solution outside the United States? Well, all of our alliance partners are also U.S. based um, because our grant does fund a little bit of funding to the alliance partners. I don't think that we would be uh, sanctioned to, to hire or bring on alliance partners that were overseas. Uh, it's not, hasn't come up as a question, but uh, I suspect not. Um, if the alliance partner, though, finds, you know, that the best material or the best resource to solve your problem is overseas, they're certainly going to recommend that. But um, the partners that you do work with are going to be U.S.-based. Got a question over here. John? Yes, as a public relations and marketing communications uh, outfit, we have clients who often have things that might be solutions. So. My question is, should SATOP be a resource that we present our clients' capabilities to? And are there more SATOPs around the U.S. that we should be aware of for 
the types of organizations that might have solutions? I'm not aware of too many other programs like SATOP. Um, one of the things I'm working on next year, I've got a, a small grant from the SBA to do sort of an online portal that might have the kind of opportunity you're talking about where people who have solutions could, could uh, collaborate with people who have problems. Um, in this case, really, the, the solutions all come from the, the knowledge base of the alliance partners. So there's not really an opportunity to, to uh, use SATOP as, as marketing for a small business client's capabilities unless they happen to be an aerospace industry company and they want to join as an alliance partner. Some of our alliance partners are small businesses. Um, Design by Analysis, you saw a couple of examples from them as a perfect example in Connecticut. They're a small business and they're actually helping, oh, I'm squeezing this thing here. Uh, I'm gonna do the alliance partners here. They're actually helping, um, they're actually making business connections for themselves while they're helping small businesses. So back to the partners. Um, but right now, uh, you know, a, a every now and then a connection is made where uh, a large company might see a technology that they think is very cool that the small business is having a challenge with and then they end up working with them later because that might fit a need. But as a rule, it's not really an opportunity for, uh, for publicizing. Designed by Analysis up in Connecticut was a partner of mine. Uh, Len was with us in the Central Connecticut State University complex. Great, yeah, I didn't know that. Flynn. Does the program also do things like help with something like technical writing for a product? I'm sorry, te does what? Te technical writing for a product? No, we don't get involved in technical writing or marketing or commercialization. Uh, it's strictly engineering types of solutions. It would be great if we had enough funding to do something like that. Great. Any other questions? Beth, thank you so much. Great thank presentation. You. World famous clicker. Um, I'm going to deviate just a little bit, and I'd like to introduce a, a, a longtime friend, uh, Chip Parmley, who's come up from Princeton this morning, and I'd like him to talk a little bit about who he is, what he does, and I hope you find this interesting because I do. You can use this one if you'd like. Thank you very much, Les. I uh, I sort of got. Uh, hit with this a few minutes ago, I think out of compassion for my long trip here this morning. I was up at, I think, uh, 3.15, I left the house at five. But a little bit about myself, I, I guess I met Les maybe three years ago through a mutual friend, and I work with what was a family business, which my father started in 1953 in New York. It was an insurance brokerage firm and he had done a short stint at Chubb right out of Princeton and then started his own firm. And I joined in 1977, and I had the good fortune of meeting a VC about a year into my career at my country club. And this was when the venture community was very much of a cottage industry, and they were looking for a new broker. So um, up until that point, really, our firm was sort of all over the lot. I mean, we had manufacturing companies, we had service companies, we had distribution companies, food service companies. And this VC started introducing me to their portfolio companies. And back then, most of the venture funds were generalists. I mean, they would invest in medical devices and drug discovery, drug delivery, data hardware, software, pretty, every, pretty much everything and anything. As a matter of fact, this, this particular fund even invested in a racquetball club of all things, which was a write-off ultimately. But um, so they liked my enthusiasm and I was then introduced to another fund also down in the Princeton area. And that fund 
many of you probably know today, which is a, one of the top tier, is, is called Axel Partners. They're a California, London-based fund now, but the founding general partner is still a very close friend and they're still a, a client. And I saw this as an interesting business model because my, my theory was that if I'm doing business with the fund, you know, and now I can get introductions to their portfolio companies, you theoretically have an annuity built in as long as you do a good job. So this was circa probably 1980, 81. Built up the portfolio to where we now have about 50 venture funds that we work with. Um, I would say logistically from Boston to Washington and a few in other parts of the country. And in around the early 90s, I met an entrepreneur, I was telling Joe um, over here, I met an entrepreneur at an event like this and he was looking for money. And you know, I'm not an intermediary or a banker or anything like that, but I like this guy. And this was at a, a chamber of commerce function and the guy was obviously extremely bright, very aggressive, and very drunk. And, uh, but I kind of liked his chutzpah. And so I gave him my card, and he's looking at it, and he sees, sees insurance, employee benefits. He said, well, how are you going to help me? I, he said, my wife is petrified that I'm going to blow all my 401k money, which I paid the tax on, to start this company. So I said, well, you know, send me some information about what you do. He had a database software tool, which anybody who's in the software business today knows probably about a, a tool called Irwin. And anyway, this fellow, Ben Cohen, had founded this company and designed the tool. And I introduced him to some funding sources, and the company just took off. They grew to about probably $200 million in sales. Morgan Stanley took them public. We were their broker. We did everything for them. And I said to myself, well, you know, here's a way, El Chippo, where you can reciprocate to the VCs who up to this point have been so generous to you and also help out the entrepreneur. And um, so we started, my brother and I and one of our Boston um, guys, we started doing more and more of this. And then we said in the mid-90s, you know, we really ought to become investors too. We ought to get some skin in the game. So uh, in probably 95, 96, we invested in our first fund, which was an energy fund. And then in 2000, we went into a sort of a broad-based fund, which does software optics, uh, devices, a number of other things. And then in 2006, we went into a healthcare fund, which does not do drugs, but devices, healthcare IT, which of course is very shishi right now, and healthcare services. And we then re-upped in their next fund uh, last December. And then we're also in a fund which Les knows quite well up in Albany, High Peaks Venture Partners, uh, who we've had a wonderful relationship with. They've just had a first closing on their second fund. We were a little bit late on getting into fund one so we have some skin in the game, and then my brother and I are also members of the Tech Valley Angel Network, which is an Albany angel group which meets monthly. And we've done some direct investing through that. Um, any success, I would say, to be quite frank with you, has been pure luck. Um, so we spend about, between the three of us, uh, who are the, really the finders within our company, we spend probably about 60 to 70 percent of our time really trying to help companies find funding sources. And what that leads to is it becomes very much of a sort of a, um, a catalyst for our insurance business when the companies get funded ultimately. But we're very, very patient because we recognize that the startup uh, world is very risky. We have had to become much more sophisticated in this process because we obviously don't want to cheapen ourselves with the venture folks who are clients and friends, and we don't want to flood their inboxes with deals that they're never going to touch. But where our sort of value proposition is, we know which funds have money, we know where they invest, what industries, bite size, logistics, um, whether the market is more important to a particular fund versus the management team. 
and um, and it's been just a you know a great ride. So um, uh, and then that's really led to you know when companies get term sheets, usually the first two things that they need to do is they need to get DNO insurance and they need to get the guys insured for key man purposes, and we do that, and then that leads into all the other different services that we provide as the companies grow organically. So um, this is what I do, and um, um, are there any questions? It's a little sexy, I guess, for an insurance broker, but uh, um, that's the, uh, the pitch. Chip and his brother and working with his company for, for, s for a bunch of years now, uh, this is an opportunity for our companies to attain funding, and there's not one of our companies that's not looking for funding and getting closer to the Tech Valley Angels, getting closer to CHIP, getting closer to actual funding, which there's been a dearth of, of funding here in the Hudson Valley, I think is going to be a plus for all of us and all of our companies. Uh, thanks, Chip. Thanks a million for coming. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks, Les. Thanks, Chris. Can we move on the fly or what? Um, our next presenter is someone very well known in this area. Uh, he also has been a dear friend for a long time. We go back to a whole nother industry together, uh, back in the point of purchase display business when I first met John back in the late 90s, mid 90s. It's been a long time. We've both uh, aged well together. <laughs> and uh, well, at least one of us has. John's going to do something a little different this morning, and um, I'm not going to steal any thunder. John, come on up. John Mallon. Hey, Jeremy, could you run that for me? Well, it, uh, it may be that it's not going to work. Oh, I don't know. I may teach, I may write a book, whatever the hell. Mary, mother of Christ. We don't Helen? So uh, what is the the word from the sound stage, a sound booth? Is it, are we the one rule in marketing that I learned over the years has been no matter how much you prepare, if it can go wrong, it will go wrong. And so we did prepare for this startup, and it, we've had a little bit of a glitch, but... Uh, Beg your pardon? <laughs> oh, yes, okay. Well, um, I'm just going to begin then, uh, Les and, and, and team. Oh, wait, here it is. Okay. The 13 nations of OPEC have still not been able to decide by how much to increase okay. the price of oil. Saudi Arabia... How much time we got? Yesterday, for further consultations with his government, seconds, he returned to the Vienna... This is Ed Fletcher in Vienna. Take two, Q. Howard. I don't have to tell you things are bad. Everybody knows things are bad. It's a depression. Everybody's out of work or scared of losing their job. The dollar buys a nickel's worth. Banks are going bust. Shopkeepers keep a gun under the counter. Punks are running wild in the street, and there's nobody anywhere who seems to know what to do, and there's no end to it. We know the air is unfit to breathe, and our food is unfit to eat. And we sit watching our TVs while some local newscaster tells us that today we had 15 homicides and 63 violent crimes, as if that's the way it's supposed to be. We know things are bad, worse than bad. 
They're crazy. It's like everything everywhere is going crazy, so we don't go out anymore. We sit in the house, and slowly the world we're living in is getting smaller, and all we say is, please, at least leave us alone in our living rooms. Let me have my toaster and my TV and my steel-belted radios, and I won't say anything. Just leave us alone. Well, I'm not going to leave you alone. I want you to get mad. I don't want you to protest. I don't want you to write. I don't want you to write to your congressman because I wouldn't know what to tell you to write. I don't know what to do about the depression and the inflation and the Russians and the crime in the street. All I know is that first, you've got to get mad. You've got to say, I'm a human being. God damn it. My life has value. So, I want you to get up now. I want all of you to get up out of your chairs. I want you to get up right now and go to the window, open it, and stick your head out and yell, I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore. I want you to get up right now. Get up, go to your windows, open them, and stick your head out and yell, I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore. Things have got to change. How many stations does this go out to? get mad. I know it goes to Louisville and Atlanta. I'm not going to take this anymore. Then we'll figure out what to do about the depression and the inflation and the oil crisis. But first, get up out of your chairs, open the window, stick your head out and yell, and say, I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore. Who are you talking Okay, thank you, Jeremy. The uh, famous line that mattered as hell, and I'm not going to take it anymore, uh, gave rise to what I wanted to talk about today. And uh, when I discussed it with Les, he said, yeah, come on in and, and talk about your idea. Uh, I, I didn't realize that we're really talking about launching a, a, a kind of new product uh, but before I, I get into that, I, I'd like to just mention that the, 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 I'm not here to talk about the recession. I'm not here to, to complain. I'm here to talk about not complaining and about doing something given the fact that we have been through a recession. And for those of us who are in business here in the Hudson Valley, the wisdom is that the recession tends to start later than it does nationally and it tends to linger longer than it does nationally. But what the, 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 the main message is that we are not going to have someone else take us out of whatever doldrums our independent, small, micro-businesses may be in. We're going to have to do it ourselves. And we can make it happen. And I want to talk a little bit today about how we can make it happen. A little We have a $15 trillion economy. We have 310 million people in our population. We've grown almost 10% since the last census. And the global markets even create more opportunity. So the, the, the things may not be as, as comfortable as they were before 2007, but there certainly are markets there that we can tap and value we can create and we can go and get the business. So what I want to do today is talk about two things. First, I want to outline how I think we can go out and get more sales. And then secondly, I want to talk about a way that we can offer you to help you do that. Let me begin by saying that this is all about micro businesses and small businesses. And we're really talking to two groups here today and two groups that we'll be talking with less about in the near future, like Beth is. We're talking about entrepreneurs who have a product or an intellectual property that needs funding, and you need to go out and find sources of funding to move your product forward. But we're also talking in the Hudson Valley about ongoing businesses, businesses that have been established, like the the people with the salami business, and they need to find new ways, we need to find new ways to go out and find more customers, find more of the right customers. Both of these businesses, both the tech startups and both the ongoing family businesses and the micro businesses, share two things in common. They don't have enough time, they don't have enough resources, they don't have the right attention to go do what we need to do to find more business. 
And I think there's another issue that which, which really gave rise to what I'm talking about this morning, and I call it the Kingston Kvetching. When I moved my business from Manhattan to Kingston long before the recession, 1995, I thought it would be a great opportunity to work in a national market but be located in a comfortable small town atmosphere where I could walk out and meet the banker, uh, meet my insurance person, uh, and, and you can do that. It's a wonderful place to work. But what I found was, as I got to know more and more people, even when times were good, they would complain about, I'm not being able to get more business. How can I get more business? I can't afford someone like you, but I really need to know how to do it. And I realized that we need to, th that there is a way that any of us, even the smallest of our businesses, can go out and find more customers, more of the what right customers. And that led me to create what I call COMPASS. COMPASS is an acronym called for Creative Opportunity Mapping, Planning, and Strategy Process. And it's an acronym I must give credit to my former colleague, Gretchen Reed, who is now the Director of Communications at Mohonk Preserve. She's the greatest acronym creator I have ever met. But COMPASS, it's a long name, but it is really opportunity mapping, and it's a good name because as an opportunity mapping, it points us in the right direction. And by that I mean, it, it takes, it's a, it's a process that goes ready, aim, fire, versus ready, fire, aim. And I think you all know what I'm talking about, that so often we get an idea, we think it's going to help our marketing, we go for the idea, it's a tactic, and the tactic doesn't really get great results because it's not driven by a solid set of goals and a solid strategy. So let me move into how Compass works, and then I'll talk a little bit more about how we might make that available to our community. Compass works in four steps. The first step is we define and assay your critical aspects of your business, including the mission, the goals, your current business strategies, and the business environment. Now this takes place in a workshop setting, so it's not just that one is sitting there and scratching their head and doing it. But our idea is that there will be a workshop of like businesses, not like business, workshop of different businesses, and we would have one another supporting one another, helping create ideas, helping create uh, strategies. But in the very beginning, we look at the situation that we're in. And step two, having examined your situation, we look at the opportunities for growth and success, easily said. But this is where the power of teamwork comes in, where the power of brainstorming comes into play. We're all too busy. We're all so close to our businesses. We have habits that keep us from looking beyond the scope of where we are. Having people around us in a workshop setting will certainly help us do a better job at seeing opportunities that may be before us, but opportunities that we don't recognize at the moment. And you know, I, I think personally there's, there's no better group of people to be with under any circumstance than with a group of ent entrepreneurs. Uh, this is why I so like coming to these meetings and, and I, I know Les share, shares the same feeling that there's, there's just a tremendous amount of energy, uh, uh, optimism, uh, refusal to let whatever comes about put us down than being in a room with entrepreneurs and I think that that is something that could make Compass a truly exceptional uh, experience for people. Moving on to the third steps, we take these opportunities and we prioritize them, and then we select just one. Well, actually, we prioritize the opportunities, we select three, and then from three, we end up with just one. One opportunity to work on. One opportunity that is, you know, high speed versus slow speed, easiest versus most difficult most feasible versus least feasible. From all these opportunities, we pick one that we want to examine, we want to work on, we want to see how we can implement. And then in step four, we take that opportunity through six steps. First, we, you know, we clearly define the opportunity, and we have our peers around us, our fellow entrepreneurs, helping us focus so that we're not, so that we're being really candid, we're being specific, we're being hard about our facts. Then we look at what are the factors that hold back, that limit us, 
and we articulate what those are. The next step is we look at what are the things that we have available to us that can fuel these opportunities, that can help us actually realize them. And there's some digging in here. It may be, sure, we have to look and see what kind of money that might be available, but there may be partners, there may be family, there may be situations, there may be events, there may be organizations like Beth's organization that it's there, you don't even know is there until you start looking and you start researching. Then we go into what we call the creative strategy, which is all about how. How are we going to overcome the limits how are we going to seize the, the resources we have and make something happen? And then we take that decision and we lay out the action steps. What specific steps do we need to take when in order to seize the opportunity that we've examined and we've come up with? These steps will be used to organize your activities moving from the very first to the final step. But before we push the action button, we also decide how do we want to measure our success. Again, seizing one opportunity may not end up being a way to add X percent to the bottom line by itself. It may contribute to adding X percent to the bottom line. So we really want to be really clear about looking at an opportunity, what is it going to give us, and how that plays into the larger goal of, say, growing our business, or adding X percent to the bottom line. That way we can track its success. And the whole idea of Compass is that we would do this four times a year or three times a year, however many times makes sense, so that we would have a series of opportunities being sought. We'd have a period of time in which we could achieve the action on one opportunity, and then another, and then another. The thinking being that what if we small businesses, our small family businesses, our startups, if we started, if we were moving purposefully, taking action, and getting results. So that is the, 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 the notion behind opportunity mapping. It is uh, a process that we developed we haven't launched yet, so what I'm realizing as I'm speaking uh, less is we really are talking about launching a new, a new product, a new service. And the next step will be that we, JMC Marketing Communications, will be working in partnership with HBCFI to run the first two, well, one or two pilot uh, opportunity mapping workshops in the early part of next year. We've got a commitment from Dragon Search Marketing and Rick is out there clicking the slides for me. Thank you. They have a Dragon Search Marketing is an outstanding social marketing and search engine optimization company based here in Kingston. And like us, it works nationally. And they're moving into new digs on 280 Wall Street and they're making their conference room available to us uh, for the very first uh, beta testing of the opportunity mapping workshops. We'll have more information flowing to you. And if you can just flip the slide, we can, we can, uh, okay, sorry it didn't, <laughs> uh, the colors didn't play on the screen, but if you would contact uh, Les Newman, who you all know, or me, John Mallon, and my email address is john at mallon.com. Uh, we, uh, we will uh, be glad to follow through with you and we'll be promulgating information on the startup of the next uh, or the very first beta test workshops. Our hope is to shake it out, to make it work really well, really practically, and then offer this as a service to a larger number of small and, 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 and uh, family-owned businesses, startup businesses in the Hudson Valley. And uh, uh, that's the idea that we have. We wanted to present it to you today to, to let you know about it, invite you to contact us and, and uh, come on board for the early uh, workshops in January or February and we'll uh, be letting you know how this goes as time rolls on. Thank you. And if you have any questions. Anybody have any questions? Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. The, uh, what exactly are these workshops? Are, are they to test out your process or to apply the process to a, a potential business? The, we actually did one beta test of the workshop, so we know it works. We did it 
unfortunately, with a multinational company, and we did it by accident with a business unit, and uh, we had teams from around the world break out and follow this process, and it actually worked very well. What we want to do is test it with real small businesses, micro businesses. So if I'm answering your question correctly, the businesses would sign up for the workshop and we take them through the process. We would have, the vision is to have groups of six, five or six people around a table. Those five or six in a certain size company may be from the same company or from much smaller, it might be five or six owners of smaller companies. We would have moderators in the room for each group, people who are from the communications field, like Jeremy's group, like Connie Schneider, who's with us here today, like Dragon Search Marketing, each of us bringing our own disciplines and helping coach the entrepreneurs through the process. Um, what we'd like to do is have one or two of those workshops in January or February and really fine tune the process and then uh, we have some plans to go out and find some sponsorship, if possible, and begin offering it on a wider basis. Nothing can do better than helping the businesses that are here find ways to do better and grow. And we think that will be one of the most powerful co contributors to our, our regional economic development that there is. Great job, John. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> You did good. You stayed up all night and you studied hard. That's We're emailing each other last night at 11.30, so we, we kid not. Um, <clears throat> I hope you enjoyed the presentation this morning. I, I certainly did. Uh, I, before we conclude, I would just like to thank our sponsors who have contributed to us being here in 2010. Uh, Sawyer Savings, Rondout Savings, Ulster Savings, who am I missing, Ralph? Mid-Hudson Federal Credit Union, um, Hudson Valley Technology Development Center, Steve Ackerman from Sally Ackerman, all your IP needs, go to Steve. And of course, Media 721, we couldn't do this without Jeremy and his, his great staff. Thank you to all of us. Um, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, Happy Hanukkah, Happy Kwanzaa. Happy first of the year. Uh, we're really looking forward to next year, and thank you all for coming and supporting this effort.